So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Katherine Colbert, and I'm the uh, director of the Athena Center for Leadership Studies, and it's thr I'm thrilled to have you all here uh, to join us for the last power talks of the season uh, with Helene Gale. And uh, I just wanted to give you a, a quick overview of what we plan to do tonight. Uh, Helene and I are going to have a conversation. I have a whole bunch of questions that I'd like to, uh, to ask her. Uh, but as uh, early as we can, we will uh, open it up to questions from all of you because uh, I've learned over the years that however much I work on really interesting and probing questions, audiences always ask better ones than I can even dream of. So we will open it up to, to your questions soon as well. Uh, just for those of you who don't know or haven't come to an Athena Center event, the Athena Center started two and a half years ago. We offer leadership programs for uh, Barnard students. Now 150 students are enrolled in our uh, leadership, uh, Athena Scholars program. We also offer a whole host of leadership lab workshops that teach a range of leadership skills from negotiation, communications, uh, management skills. And those are open not only to Barnard students, but to our alumni and women across New York. So we urge you uh, to check out those offerings. There's uh, some new ones coming up uh, next month for uh, non-students that focus on communication and entrepreneurship. And um, we urge you to participate in those. Uh, and uh, lastly, we do a variety of public programs, conferences, this Power Talk lecture series, uh, and the Athena Film Festival, which this past February had uh, 3,000 people come to watch uh, films about women in leadership. So we urge you to come back next year uh, to that event. So let me introduce to you someone who needs no introduction to the Barnard campus, uh, the recipient of our Medal of Distinction at this year's graduation. Uh, Helene Gale is president and CEO of CARE USA, a leading international uh, humanitarian organization. Last year, CARE's uh, 10,000 staff ran poverty-fighting programs that reached 122 million people in 84 countries. Uh, since joining CARE in 2006, Dr. Gale has led efforts to reinforce CARE's commitment to empowering women and girls and to bring lasting change to impoverished communities. Under her leadership, Dr. Gale has leveraged the power of CARE's corporate and NGO partners to ex uh, significantly expand CARE's reach across the globe. She is an expert on health, global development, and humanitarian issues, spent 20 years at the Centers for Disease Control, working primarily on HIV and AIDS, uh, and has since worked with the Bull uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, directing the HIV uh, AIDS program and other health programs across the globe. She serves on several boards, uh, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Rockefeller Foundation, Colgate Palmel of Company, uh, is on the US Department of State's Foreign Affairs Policy Board. As you can see, an illustrious background uh, and uh, most recently named one of Foreign Policy Magazine's top 100 global thinkers and the Newsweek's top 10 women in leadership. So we're thrilled to have Dr. Gale with us, uh, but most importantly, she is a Barnard grad, one of ours, <laughs> class of 1976. And so I wanted to start, Dr. Gale, with just asking you a little bit about how you got from Barnard to this extraordinary position making such a difference in the world? Um, how I got from Barnard, uh, I, you know, I guess <coughs> first and foremost, I, I just think my experience at Barnard was life changing. You know, I was actually a transfer student. I started out, um, I graduated from high school um, a year early, didn't know what I wanted to do. I kind of graduated a year early because I looked up and realized I had enough credits to graduate and it was time to get away from home and what the heck. And um, went to a school that my, um, my sibling just uh, ahead of me was at because it was an easy application and hadn't really thought it through. Went there, didn't feel challenged, and for a lot of reasons, um, wanted to be in New York City. I thought that would be a, uh, an interesting experience, little girl from Buffalo, New York. Um, and also, you know, um, 
by that time had started thinking about what were the kinds of attributes that I wanted. Uh, I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to be in an environment that you know I felt was stimulating, that um, provided you know broader exposure than I had had. And as I was saying, we had a small reception uh, before this. I'm not sure if I would have had the wisdom to go to Barnard versus Columbia had I had the option. Um, because at that time, if you wanted to go to Columbia, you know, and I was kind of, you know, I was pushing myself. I wanted to go to New York City. What was the best school in New York City? It was Columbia. So therefore, you know, I wanted to go to Columbia. But, you know, you only had the option of going to Barnard. Well, you know, again, looking back, I'm not sure I would have had the wisdom to have done that. In, you know, in retrospect, I am happy that that I didn't have that option and I ended up in Barnard because I think it is truly the best of both worlds. It's an opportunity to focus on women and women's leadership. Um, what are the things that are important about us building confidence uh, around who we are, things that really focus on you know, developing women as leaders, you know, and at the same time you have this broader Columbia University experience that you can take part in in whatever way you want. So, you know, first and foremost, I'm thrilled that by happenstance and, you know, um, to your point, um, I haven't planned anything. I never have. You know, everybody, you know, calls me and asks me, what's your advice? What should, what's your five-year plan? What should I do? I have no clue. I have never planned my life. Probably never will. It's all been happenstance. But, you know, there's been a certain thread that has continued to, to lead me in a certain direction. So I'm pleased that my life brought me to Barnard. I think it's a unique uh, opportunity. And as we were also saying, more than ever, I think the choice to come to Barnard is a much more deliberate choice in many ways. And what Barnard has done is much more deliberate because of all the Seven Sisters schools where the, the only one that had the choice of another institution and, and made the deliberate choice not to. So you had Harvard that, you know, and I'm not saying anything about Radcliffe, uh, you know, and what the decision that they made, but, you know, they made the decision to not continue that. All the other seven sister schools don't have the, you know, the, really the option because they don't have another institution, you know, that is kind of parallel or adjacent to it. So they continue to be, um, women focus, but they didn't have that option. Barter took the, you know, had the option and decided that there is something unique about it. So again, I can't say enough. And as I was saying, you know, I go many places, I speak, and there are Barnard women who come up and say, I knew you were Barnard woman, I could just tell. So there is something special about it. And I am very pleased that, you know, that, that I had that, that, that background. I, you know, credit a lot of who I am and the decisions I took because of coming to this place and this experience. I didn't, you know, I didn't plan to go to med in, into medical school. Um, there was nobody in my immediate family that were doctors. Um, I, as I often say, I wanted to go to school to be a social activist and there wasn't a major in social activism. So, you know, I said, well, what's a practical way in which you can make a contribution to the world um, and do things that are core and central to the things that people care about but also be able to pay your rent. And, you know, there are a lot of pre-meds. This is a big pre-med community. And so, you know, one thing led to the next. Uh, I decided that medicine was a good um, course and uh, went on um, to medical school. And then uh, somewhere in there, I uh, kind of started getting this notion of public health, which Again, coming from a background where I really looked at how can you drive social change, public health is kind of that amalgamation of um, medicine, but looking at the broader societal issues. And you know, I often say, you know, if you're a doctor doing clinical practice, you're looking at um, your patient as an individual, where when you're looking at public health, your your patient is actually a community, a nation, or the world. And I've always thought about, you know, how do I have, how can I have a lever for change that looks at broader, um, you know, population level impact. So public health appealed to me. I went to the Centers for Disease Control because they have a, 
particular program that, that allows you to, to get some um, training in public health, thought I was going to go there for a couple years and maybe go back and practice, stayed there for 20 years because it was really compelling. So, you know, that, those were kind of the roots of what kind of got me onto the path that I was on. And, um, you know, one thing led to the next. And as I said, I've never planned anything. Uh, things kind of happen. My thread has always been how can I have the greatest impact on the greatest number of people? Uh, how do I use my tools of, in medicine and public health as a driver for that? And I think when you're willing to take some risk and not necessarily think about um, a career path going from point A to point B, but looking at you know what are the things along the way that may be interesting that speak to your passion that may not be the um, you know necessarily the um, um, least risk way of doing things, but willing to jump out there and do some things that just speak to who you are and your passion. I think you you know I think ultimately you you end up having a career path that actually starts to make sense. So that's what I've done. I've tried to follow my passion, follow the things that I think um, can make a difference. And it's really led me to uh, a career that, you know, has been very satisfying, very rewarding, and, you know, I guess in some ways successful because Barnard's giving me some fancy award in a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> Well, I don't think that's <laughs> along the reason. With the, along with the President of the United States, you know, so I mean, hey, can't be so bad. That's great. Well, I, I'm so glad to hear you talk about this nonlinear career because we do talk to our students a lot about the importance of following your passions, yeah. and that's, it's terrific. Talk a little bit, if you would, about the care programs. I, I understand that you really focus not only just on alleviating poverty, but empowering women and girls and as a strategy for social change and a strategy for public health. T talk a little bit, if you would, about uh, why you've adopted that strategy. Yeah, so, you know, um, when people think about um, alleviating poverty, you know, we often, or, you know, poor people in other countries, you know, people think about, can we get them food? Can, get, can we get them water? Can we, you know, uh, educate children, whatever? And often it's focused on um, how do you provide for people's basic human needs. And a lot of what development has been over the last few decades has been about you know, giving people water, giving people shelter, giving people, you know, building schools, et cetera. But you, know, you can do that and 10 years later you come back and you know, the building may be there, but children aren't getting education. The well may be there, but it's broken. Um, you know, the, there may be a, a health clinic, but it's not accessible to people, and women are not allowed to leave their home to get uh, health services anyway, so, you know, so what that there's a clinic. So, you know, I think that the whole field of development has recognized that you can meet people's basic needs, and oftentimes in emergency situations, that's all you can do. But if you really are trying to look at how do you, how do you make sure that people break out of poverty, then you can't just look at the consequences of poverty, you know, lack of education, lack of water, lack of health, et cetera. But you also have to look at what are the root causes. Why are some people, some communities, some nations mired in poverty? What are the things that drive inequity? They're the same things that drive inequities here in our own country. You know, it's, it's the fact that people are marginalized, they're discriminated against, there's inequities. Um, there, are, there are, you know, people's basic sense of the lack, or lack of their, their acknowledgement of what their basic rights are and their sense that they have the ability to ask of the system to grant them the rights that they're born with. And so those are the same sorts of things that we try to work with with, with people um, in our work. And I often say that, you know, if whether it's water, education, health, et cetera, that's really just a lever in many ways, you know, a, a, a way of entering into the community to then work on the underlying causes, inequity, poor governance, um, lack of, uh, of, of um, exercising human rights, et cetera. And one of the things that's really core and fundamental in that and all the work that we do is that girls and women are systematically 
um, excluded from recognizing their full potential in many of the societies that we work in. And so if you, know, if you look at any um, um, measure of equality, whether it's access to education, health, uh, the fact that women work more but earn less, um, you know, uh, women are the primary farmers wherever you look at in the world but own no land, um, that women make no decisions in their household yet and still they're responsible for you know, what happens. So we looked at the fact that women and girls are, you know, throughout the world, um, bear the brunt of poverty, but that also if you look at any, you know, all the um, um, evidence around the world, that if you change the life of a woman or a girl, you don't just change her life, you actually have long lasting change for communities. So if a girl is educated, instead of being sold into marriage at age 13 and starting to have children, she delays um, you know, getting married, she delays sexual debut, she has fewer children, she's more likely to, to earn an income. If she earns an income, she's more likely to use that income to send her children to school. And so the whole family and the whole community starts changing. So you know, statistically, given the fact that girls and women are you know, bear the brunt of poverty and make up the largest proportion of people who are poor. If you help girls and women, you're gonna also, just from a numerical standpoint, have the greatest impact on poverty. But you also create kind of a virtuous cycle that doesn't just help that girl or that woman, but you also um, have intergenerational change because a woman is more likely to pow plow what she earns or the education that she gets into making her family circumstances different and that's where you kind of have this kind of ripple effect of change in communities and you know I can talk about it more when we you know get into it but I, you know example after example of what it means to bring that kind of balance into society it's not you know let a, a, a takeover of women, which I'm often asked by my um, male donors and colleagues, you know, well, why aren't you talking about boys and men? Well, you know, boys and men benefit if women actually are able to be part of the equation. So it's really about how, what's the most efficient way of helping whole communities um, have a greater start and move ahead. And I think, you know, the answer is that empowering girls and women does that. Now, in different parts of the world, obviously, the kind of uh, fundamentalist movements exist in all different parts of the world and are, in, in many respects, some of them put up the largest impediments to women's advancement. Um, as a health matter, uh, issues like reproductive health, HIV and AIDS, et cetera, do you find more opposition if you're working on those issues as opposed to what you're describing in terms of empowering women of girls women and girls, or is it fairly uh, even distribution of discrimination? Yeah, I think it's, it's fairly even. Um, but, you know, the caveat is always that when I say our work is focused on empowering women and girls, it's also on the other part of the equation, which is how do you bring boys and men into that discussion? And, you know, um, time after time, if you talk to a woman whose sense of herself has been changed, who has changed from being a prisoner in her own home um, to being a breadwinner and bringing value into the family, the man also change in, changes in the process. And so, you know, I think, you know, the focus on empowering girls and women has a huge impact on how men are also able to break out of the bondage that they're in because you know men are also trapped in traditional male um, you know sense of what that means so you know last week I just got back from Uganda Saturday and, I, and we were on this uh, trip and um, visiting one of our community projects and talking to women who are part of our village savings and loans program. So it's a program where women save and uh, some men too, but you know, save their assets and then make small loans that uh, allow them to start businesses. You know, and these are oftentimes women who have never had any experience with um, 
money and um, starting businesses and it gives them a whole new lease on life. But it also give, brings them value to their homes and often these are women who have been abused, who have been battered, who have been treated as you know, uh, mere objects in their homes. And so you know, we're talking to this group of women and one of the husbands of one of the women stood up and said, uh, well, actually, it was a play. Sorry to back up. They, they did a little play that was a skit about you know, how having women earn resources has really changed the whole shape of the community. And in the skit, there was a man who beat his wife. And you know, um, after she started uh, earning money, he started valuing her, helping with household chores, et cetera. So it was a skit they put on. And then one man stood up and he said, you know, that was my life. I used to beat my wife. Here she is. I mean, you know, this is very candid. You know, I used to beat my wife. Um, that's all I knew. I grew up thinking that that's what you did. If she didn't cook the food on time, you beat her. Um, you know, that's what you do. And uh, he said, but now after my wife has changed um, and I started to appreciate what she's doing for our family, I started to appreciate her more. We have fun together, we talk as a couple, we share, we make decisions together, I help with the household chores because she's better at working the farm than I, the, the fields than I am, she does that, I help with the kids. You know, I mean, it's this kind of total change in family dynamics that happened because a woman uh, is now seen as somebody of value. And so it also helps men break out of some of their stereotypic sense of who they should be and what's acceptable. So if you would, I'd, I'd love you to comment a little bit about leadership, um, particularly in the nonprofit sector, uh, where you are heading one of the, the largest nonprofits here in the US and probably around the globe. Um, first of all, I'm interested on whether kind of notions of leadership change from country to country. Is there a differing view of both leadership generally and women's leadership as you go around the world? Um, I think, uh, if I would say, go, uh, uh, looking at around the world, I think one of the things I would be critical about the US versus other parts of the world is we're less deliberate about women's leadership. And so, you know, again, I just came from Uganda where they have adopted what was the, um, I guess it was the Cairo women's platform that said uh, any country that wants to move forward should have at least 30% of their parliament, legislature, women. And, you know, more and more countries that I go to, they are reserving and making it, you know, part of their common practice that 30% or more of their legislature should be women. And there's study after study that shows that, you know, there's this kind of tipping point of 30% where if you have, you know, 30% or more, if you have less than that, women feel, um, you know, that they, there's not enough, there's not enough critical mass to actually make a difference. But the 30% is kind of a tipping point. You see that on, you know, studies about, um, board compos corporate board composition and other things. There's this kind of tipping point that's around 25 to 30 percent. So you know, you go around the world, and you know, um, Uganda that has uh, lots of other problems, but they have made a commitment to that 30 percent, and I think they're at about 45 percent of their legislature are women. You know, here I think it's about six per 16 percent, maybe. Um, you know, uh, so. I think we're not as deliberate, nor, you know, you look at countries like um, the Scandinavian countries that long ago have adopted a sense that there should be some percentage, um, and they're in the 40 to 50 percent, uh, and have had women prime ministers, and, you know, it's, it's made a huge difference. So, you know, I think this notion of being much more deliberate about it, where we have taken for granted that um, we're progressive because, you know, we have, because we're America, whatever, but we have not been as deliberate about some of the things that I think would really move us forward um, as a society. 
Um, it you know doesn't mean that just because you reserve a certain percentage, that um, that means that you know the battles are over. But I, I do think that we're not taking it as deliberately as as we could. I, I'm interested in that because <coughs> particularly in the nonprofit sector, where you think so many women go into non the nonprofit world that the pipeline is just packed. I mean, the, the excuse of you can't get women in leadership because there's not enough women below is just no longer true. It hasn't been true for probably 20 years. We're still, however, even in the nonprofit sector, at, at what you say in that you know 16 to 22 percent in leadership. What's, uh, you're an activist. You're, you're somebody who, who pushes the envelope in all things that you do. What can we do about that? You know, I I, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it, um, it's just in, it, um, somebody who spoke here um, at uh, commencement not too long ago. I can't remember what year was it. Last year, year before, Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook. You know, she talks about this ambition gap, and I think it's a very real thing that to be a woman and say that you're ambitious and shooting for the top job is still not acceptable. And she, you know, Cheryl can say it much better than I do and she, you know, she has really been very eloquent on this issue about the fact that women still feel like it's there's something inappropriate about saying, you know, I am shooting for, you know, I want to be the president of the United States one day or I want to be, you know, the head of J.P. Morgan, or you know, whatever, uh, or head of care, or whatever, you know. And I think there's still something about how we are taught, um, and how the society feeds back to us about ambition, that makes women feel that it is not okay to say that I actually am shooting for the top job. And I think until we do something to eliminate that sense of this ambition gap, because the you know the opportunities are there. I don't think that the barriers are what they used to be. I mean, there's still barriers, you know, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but I don't think that the barriers are there as much as our own sense of willingness to stand up and say, you know, I really want to have that top job, and I think I am, you know, that I'm good enough to do this. And I, you know, I won't go into, um, you know, real specifics of things that people have, asked me to think about that I have demurred and said, well, I don't think I'm you know, quite qualified for that. And then the next day I see a male colleague who has less qualification than I do say, well, you know, I'm going for that. And I'm, you know, and I totally bewildered that, my God, you know, I didn't think in my own, estimation of myself, I didn't think that I was qualified, and here's somebody who has lesser qualifications than I that just says, of course, they asked me, I'm there. So I just think there is something about our own sense of um, uh, willingness to take big leaps that I think we still need to work on. The, uh, another area that we, we talk a lot about at Athena is uh, finding people who preceded you, the mentors, the inspiration. Who were, your, who were your mentors? Who inspired you as you were coming up the ropes? Well, you know, back to what I said before about nothing in my life has been very deliberate. You know, I wish I had been better about the kinds of things that I think, um, you know, young people today, young people, I make you sound feel old, but uh, this next generation that is much better about asking for mentorship um, than I think, than, than I, think um, I ever was. And so I've had a lot of accidental mem uh, mentors, um, you know, people who have, and, and they've been primarily males because, you know, in the places that I've been, it's primarily been men who have preceded me. Um, so, you know, you know there have been many people, um, that I have kind of gleaned things from, but have not had formal mentorships from. And I, you know, I just think that's something that we should be doing more deliberately for other women. And I think 
women, you know, women should be, women just like men should be aggressive about asking for mentorship. So, you know, I've had people who have been inspirational and people who have been willing to share their wisdom. I don't think I have been as good as I could have been about deliberately seeking mentors. Uh, do you, would you consider yourself to have a particular leadership style or strategy? And uh, are there secrets that you can share with the rest of us about what makes you so successful? Um, I, yeah, I have no secrets. Um, well, I have secrets, but I'm not <laughs> telling, I'm not telling them tonight. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, one of the things that, that uh, keeps coming up about leadership that I, that I struggle with, because I don't think that I do it perfectly, but I think it is the notion of authenticity. And people talk about um, that if you think about one leadership attribute, it is the ability to be yourself and to be comfortable with yourself that is probably better than anything else. And, and you know, you know, you can have leaders who are extroverts, you can have leaders who are great communicators, you can have leaders who are introverts, you can have leaders who are great managers, you can have leaders who are poor managers. But at the end of the day, the thing that most um, allows people, you know, you have leadership and then you have followership, followership. And it, you know, if, if you're a leader, you want people who are willing to follow behind you and, and a vision that you create. And I think that that notion of authenticity, being who you are and being in touch with who you are, is one of the things that creates that bond between um, you know, a leader and people who they want to be able to move forward to realize their vision. You know, and I was, I was saying it's something that I was um, speaking at not too long ago that as I have gotten older, I have felt um, more comfortable with not being perfect because I think we all grew up with this notion, well, we all, I did, you know, that, that you know, as a woman, as African American, you know, whatever, that you, you've got to be perfect. You've got to, you know, you're, you're holding up the race, you're holding up the gender, you're, you know, you've got to be that perfect image. And there's a burden that goes with that. And, you know, there's a point at which you just realize, I don't have to be the perfect anything for anybody. I just have to be myself. Now, I'm not quite there yet. And somebody after, after the panel said to me, which I'll never forget, she said, you know, it is true that people were much more drawn to Clark Kent than they were to Superman. And, and that, that it is the Clark Kent in all of us that is the more appealing than the Superman because it is the Superman that was impervious and that you, you didn't feel that you could get close to. It was the Clark Kent in all of us that makes people want to know you and, and follow you. And so I, you know, um, that may be not gender appropriate, but you know, to the extent that I'm in touch with my inner Clark Kent, I think that I can be a better leader. Uh, which brings me to my next question, which really has to do with failure. One of the things we found in the research is that uh, men and women really respond to failure in very different ways. Men tend to externalize it, and, you know, it's obviously it's broad generalizations, but men tend to externalize failure. They say, you know, it's the climate or it was the, it was, you know, the customer or it was somebody else who caused the problem. When, women tend to say, it's <laughs> my fault. Uh, so I, I, as I'm interested in your view of failure, how you view that, what you think we can all learn from, from failing and getting up and doing it again, which I assume is something that you have to do a fair amount. Yeah, practically every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think women do a lot more self-flagellation. Um, you know, it, it's always our fault. Uh, everything is always our fault. And, you know, I keep trying to perfect the guilt-free living. You know, it's like, how do you really get to the point where you just say, it is okay, I'm not gonna be guilty, you know, this is not about me, everybody has the right to, to make mistakes. Um, and I think it's a balance because, you know, I personally would never wanna get to the point where um, I'm not, using failures as a way to learn. And I think failures, uh, you know, um, 
I remember listening to uh, a motivational thinker, a motivational speaker one time talking about failing your way to success. And I really like that notion that, you know, in some way, and he was talking about this as a guy who, I forget all the specifics, but, I, you know, he was developmentally delayed, dyslexic, you know, whatever, whatever, all the list of, you know, kind of learning disabilities who became this incredible speaker because, and, you know, he talked about the first few times that he tried speaking and people laughed him, you know, out of the uh, hall or whatever, and he kept trying and trying and he's this incredibly captivating speaker. And he said, I failed my way to success. And so I do think the ability to learn from your failures um, without the self-flagellation and you know, kind of total sense of deprecation or whatever is a great balance. But to get to the point where you say, well, you know, not my fault, nothing wrong with me, every, you know, it's all them, you know, then I think it's tipped too far. So how do you get that right balance between recognizing that we all are, um, you know, have faults, we all have things that we don't do well, and that if we keep working on them, we usually get better, and that's okay. And it's just okay to be you know, who you are, when you are, and make mistakes. All right, so I'm gonna ask one more question, then turn it over to the audience. But I, I was wondering if you might comment on the debate that America is having today around healthcare, and uh, you know, as a leading uh, person in the healthcare arena, public health, uh, could comment a little bit about both about Obamacare and the Supreme Court's looking at that question. Well, you know, it's painful to watch. I, you know, uh, again, traveling all around the world and realizing that most countries, including countries that we consider much less developed than the United States, all have some so sort of um, protection for health and access for health and accept the fact that health is a right, not a privilege, that we in America are still having this debate and calling this everything from, you know, a plot to overturn, you know, who we are as a nation and our very fabric to, <coughs> you know, whatever the extremes are. That said, I don't think that this administration went about um, the construction of our health care reform bill in the way that guaranteed the greatest success. And I think that in making huge compromises, it put the health reform in jeopardy from the word go. That said, I think it set a milestone that we can't turn back from. And so, you know, whenever there's been a major um, civil movement, whether it's, you know, civil rights, women's rights, whatever, you know, whenever you lay down a certain, you know, marker, you never totally turn that back. So I, you know, I don't know what the Supreme Court decision will be, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we did pass health care legislation that guaranteed a certain um, protection for all Americans for access to health. And I don't think we'll ever go back to where we were before. So, you know, I think it's unfortunate. I think that the way it went, you know, we went about it was probably not as aggressive as we could have been. Uh, but I think we won't ever go back to the point where people don't recognize that there is a real right to health um, and that we have the right to continue to fight for, you know, a better and better way of guaranteeing that. So let's hear from you all. I'm gonna just, uh, do we have a microphone that we can use in the audience? Any questions? Thank you for your comments. Um, perhaps if you could speak about the United States um, being one of the few countries that won't ratify CEDAW. Ratify? The, uh, um, the Commission to End Domestic Violence Against Women? Oh. Well, you know, more broadly, um, you know, the United States is not real good about ratifying things that the rest of the world does. And so, you know, although we um, 
say that we're part of the global community, we always kind of sit on the sidelines and, and you know, say that's great, but we're the United States, so we don't have to sign on on those sort of things. And it's kind of back to the point I was making about, you know, others <coughs> having accepted that, you know, there should be some guarantees around women's participation in, in policies. You know, and I can go through, um, you know, international convention after international convention, and we kind of, you know, are very engaged in the debate, but then when it comes to voting, we're like, yes, that's good for you people, but, you know, we're the United States. So I just think there is a notion in general that um, we don't take kind of our participation in the global community in the way that I think that we should, which says, yes, we're the United States, and we're the richest, we're the most powerful nation in the world, we have certain, you know, we do have certain privileges. I, you know, you can't get past it. We do. I mean, you, you know, there is a privilege that um, that comes with being the United States. But I also think there's a responsibility, and I think there's there are leadership moments that I think we miss out on, and that's one of them. Um, but I think you know, it, it also comes from the fact that our, um, you know, that, that our civil society, our population doesn't speak out about those things and we're not as informed and we don't hold our leaders accountable for some of these, uh, for some of these issues. So, you know, I don't think we're gonna get movement on, on issues that matter in the global arena until we as citizens actually say that we think it matters. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think our voice does matter in those kinds of issues. Other questions? <coughs> um, now that you're the head of uh, CARE, how much of your position and your influence is derived from your expertise in the field that's related to the organization and how much of it is really you know, management and business skills? Well, um, I think it, a lot of it's derived from my um, expertise in a broad sense. I mean, you know, CARE is not a health organization. We, we focus more broadly on the whole arena of things, whether it's water, agriculture, access to, you know, financial inclusion, whatever. Uh, but I think broadly speaking, a lot of the skills um, as a public health professional are transferable. Um, you know, a lot of the work that I do is trying to figure out one that we have enough resources for our organization to do what we do, and so I do a lot of work on, you know, fundraising and networking, and and how do we keep making sure that we're developing the kind of partnerships that allow us to um, be better at leveraging what we have as an organization. Um, I'm not the day-to-day -day manager. I have a chief operating officer who is responsible for day-to-day -day management. On the other hand, I can't be divorced from what goes on, you know, in the organization. So. You know, I think it's, you know, in some ways um, typical of many CEOs jobs where a lot of your role is really representing the organization, being the front person, if you will, making sure that you're keeping up with where, you know, the direction, where should you be leading the organization and somebody else who has a primary responsibility of the kind of nuts and bolts day-to-day -day, um, operation. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, as a doctor of medicine and, and as a master of public health, where you are now, which I think is really more utilizing your public health degree than your medicine degree, do you think that you would be where you are today without the background in medicine if you hadn't gone to medical school? Um, yeah, it's hard to say. You know, um, I think that in general, these days, the degrees that you get um, are areas that you enjoy studying that keeps you studying long enough so that you get the foundation to do whatever else you want. So, I mean, I, you know, I could have gone to law school. I could have gone to, um, you know, I could have gotten an MBA or whatever. I happened to have chosen medicine. I enjoyed it. It kept me, you know, studying. It kept me engaged, I learned a lot of things. And so the discipline of medicine and ultimately, you know, public health and, you know, 
good clinical practice that um, you know I did taught me a lot of skills that are now useful for what I what I did. I don't think I could do what I did what I've done had I not had some extended educational training that provided me the, dis the, the discipline, the analytic skills, the rigor or whatever. Um, so I don't know that medicine in and of itself uh, would have gotten, was necessary for the path that I chose, but I'm happy I chose medicine and it gives me a background that allows me to do what I've done and it kept me in school long enough to make sure that I wasn't an idiot, I guess, I don't know. Hi. How does um, CARE track the progress of the programs it's implemented around the world, um, the changes those programs might have? Yeah, it's a good point. And I, you know, there, there's, um, you know, when you take on goals like eliminating poverty, um, you know, that's not a two-year, uh, you know, there, there aren't like two-year measures or whatever. But I think what you try to do in anything when it's a long-term endeavor is have some kind of theory of what do you think actually drives the change that you're looking for, and then what are the proximal measures that you can look at that are a proxy for whether you're getting to your goal. So, you know, I often use, since I worked on HIV for a long time, you know, um, the relationship of condom use to HIV prevention. Well, you know, being able to track whether or not you're changing rates of HIV in a community, that may take 10 years, 15 years, because it's a long-term disease and it takes a long time or whatever. But if you believe that using condoms reduces the risk of getting HIV and you can measure condoms, then you know if people are increasing condoms, then the likely outcome is that you're gonna reduce HIV. So it's the same with poverty. If you can say that you feel like women being empowered makes a difference, if you can say that uh, people having greater access to good nutrition, um, the ability to have incomes, et cetera, and you can measure those things, then you ultimately believe that those things will drive whether or not um, you can have an impact on your ultimate goal. So I think you first of all have to step back and have some kind of a theoretical framework that you have, you know, through analysis been able to, you know, say that you think there's a good likelihood that that, that the inputs into that will make a difference on your long-term outcome and then be able to measure both the short-term and long-term outcomes. But, you know, <coughs> by definition, things like that are, are not easy to, to measure. But you know, as an as an example, so you know, we have put a big focus on empowering girls and women in our work, and we've looked at um, research to see whether or not that makes a difference. So um, we just finished a study in a project in Bangladesh, looking at a particular measure of malnutrition and whether or not the children whose mothers were enrolled in a women's empowerment program actually had a greater chance of reducing malnutrition or not. And it did show that you, know, you could do a standard program and rates of malnutrition went down you know, by um, a certain percentage. But if, if the mothers of those same, uh, of a, a, you know, a equivalent group of children were also enrolled in an empowerment program, their rate of malnutrition was reduced doubly. So it was a real tangible um, result, you know, result that in fact empowering women does have a tangible impact on something like you know, rates of malnutrition. And we've done that in other areas too that shows that if you are able to actually change women's outcomes and their ability to make decisions in the household and, you know, et cetera, that things like, you know, malnutrition or education or, you know, other things actually improve as well. So it's, you know, looking at those kinds of things. Um, I don't know if this is a ridiculous question, but I'm wondering if you can envision a day when poverty no longer exists in the world, at least in peaceful countries. Yeah, I think so. Um, 
You know, if I think about um, in the 30 some years that I have been, you know, working around the world and the changes that, I, that I've seen, I really do think that it is possible if we have the will and the commitment to make a difference. You know, your point about uh, peaceful is a, is an important point because I think you know it. Um, one of the biggest drivers for not changing, you know, people's circumstance <coughs> is conflict, poor governance, and issues like that. But you know, you look at a lot of the poor countries in the world; they're actually very rich countries. You know, uh, um, you know, if I look at parts of the world that have been the most impoverished, particularly places, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and other places, they're actually countries that are pretty wealthy in terms of resources, but, but governance has been bad, and you know, issues of corruption, and whether or not there is equality. So I think if you can change some of those parameters and really look at issues of inequality, marginalization, poor governance, then you really can make a huge difference. And if, at this, you know, and if you're looking at those things at kind of the macro policy level, but at the same time looking at how do you at the grassroots level change people's life circumstances and allow them to get you know, kind of a foothold on that first rung on the ladder, and if you're doing both of those things and working at both of those ends, then I, I really do think that you know, we do have a chance of ending poverty you know, in our lifetime or, you know, uh, maybe in your lifetime, maybe not mine, but uh, you know, in in the foreseeable future. So I, you know, I think it's I, I think it's ultimately possible. You know, we we live in a rich world. I mean, this is a world of endless resources. So I mean, poverty ultimately just doesn't make sense. Poverty is something that happens because those who have are not willing to give up to those who have not. And I think you know, it, if we can shift those levers then I think you know, this is a world that has enough resources that everybody should be able to have you know, the basic things. Now, will everybody be rich and drive a Bentley? No. You know, but will everybody be able to send their children to school, have access to clean water, have basic you know, health services, be able to have some of the core things that everybody wants in life? Yeah, I think so. I don't think that's out of the question at all. But I think we can't just do it by looking at the short-term factors, we've got to look at, you know, what creates inequality, because ultimately it's about inequality. You know, there are more poor people now living in middle-income countries than living in the poorest countries. And so, you know, more and more poverty around the world is going to be defined by inequity than absolute poverty. You know, there are more poor people living in India and China than in, you know, in all of Sub-Saharan Africa put together. And that's an issue of inequality. Those are the fastest growing economies in the world, but they're also becoming more and more unequal. So that's where we have to put our focus on, you know, why do some people continue to be left out even in the face of great economic growth and, you know, considerable wealth in the world? Thank you. I just want to flip the script quickly. I'm a boomer, and um, I have reached back and got the girl, you know, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions with the rising number of boomers um, for how they might be involved in helping to make the kinds of changes that you're referring to. Well, you know, um, I don't know that there's any one answer. I, I just... Um, I think we all need to think, you know, should just be conscious of in wherever we happen to be and whatever institutions we have at our hand, how can we make sure that we're using those in ways that continue to drive change? You know, and it can be through your church, through sororities, through, you know, whatever organization, um, you know, exists. I mean, I, I go, uh, a, around the country oftentimes, and there's, you know, kind of uh, uh, circles of women that, you know, whether it's book clubs or, you know, whatever, that are talking about, um, in, that could be used as vehicles for giving back to communities. 
And I just think we should be thinking all the time about what is it, you know, I think we're incredibly uh, fortunate. Anybody who's sitting in this room today is somebody who has certain privileges and, and access and opportunity. How are we using that? And are we thinking about how we use that in ways that continue to reach back and you know, make a difference. So I, you know, I don't know that there's any one answer, but I just think it's, you know, constantly being conscious of the fact that we have a responsibility. You know, and I think as part of, you know, again, we're even in the midst of, you know, this, whether it's an economic crisis or recession or, you know, coming out of a recession or whatever we're in or not in or whatever, we're still the richest nation in the world. You know, we still have an incredible, you know, every day we go on and turn on a faucet and there's water that comes out. You know, that is not the case for over a billion people in the world. And, you know, just that, um, just making people aware of that and aware of the fact that we have so much that we can give to the rest of the world or even to people who are, you know, a few blocks away from here. Um, so I, I just think it's constantly reminding ourselves of how fortunate we are and how much more we can give and how much more we can stretch and you know, thinking of ways in which we can use that. So. Hi, while gender equality is still prevailing in most parts of the world, especially third world countries, and I'm very curious, is it better for like women to walk exclusively as a group uh, or it's better for us to reach for the help of men because when decisions affecting women are made, men are the majority of people who are at table. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, I think, um, it, you know, it, when I kind of go back to the work that we do at CARE, I mean, I, I, I just think that um, you can't just change a woman's perception of herself and then send her back to the same circumstance without also making sure that the rest of um, you know, her environment, her partner, if, you know, if she has a male partner, um, you know, the society, the community also changes. So I think you have to work on both sides of the equation. And you know, it's not, um, you know, I don't advocate a women's takeover, I think it's about balance. You know, I think it's unfortunate that 50% of the world's potential has been left on the cutting room floor. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Numerically, we're not gonna get to the same place, we're not gonna use the full potential that the world has if we're not using the 50% that we're not, you know, taking into consideration. But that's not to say that that 50% should um, do what the other 50% has done up to this point, which is to, to then leave the rest behind. There's ba it's about balance. You know, um, I, I was in Egypt a couple of weeks, uh, about a month ago, and we were talking to um, these village leaders, uh, kind of, um, kind of the, the first level of elected officials for, for a community. And it was the first time in this fairly conservative area in Egypt that they had had a woman local council member. And I was asking her, well, what does it mean, what do you think it means to have a woman um, in a leadership role? And she said, well, you know, uh, what we're responsible for as council people is to collect our constituency and hear what their issues are and then bring those to the, to the local council. And she said, you know, so I bring my women constituents together who put me into office and ask them about what their issues are. And she said, you know, what, we, what, what they come to me um, and ask me to bring forward as issues are things like the garbage doesn't get collected, the water doesn't turned on, get turned on, the roads aren't paved, et cetera, et cetera. Very practical things. What my male counterparts talk about are issues that are more related to balance of power and who controls what or whatever. If I wasn't at the table, those very practical day-to-day -day issues wouldn't have been brought up. And it was a classic example of how if you didn't have that voice at the table, the dialogue and therefore the, you know, the issues that were brought forward and therefore the things that people would have focused on in terms of s solutions would have been very different. They wouldn't have taken into consideration 
the issues that were those day-to-day -day concerns that women had because they had to deal with the families and you know households and the and basic issues. On the other hand, the issues of balance of power aren't trivial either. So it's not that the what the men brought to the table weren't important, but it would have totally missed the issues that women brought to the table. So it's you know to me it's about balance. It's not that you know, women should edge all men out and only, you know, it is how do you make sure that when we, you know, when we look at the issues and come up with solutions, that they balance the issues that both men and women bring and, the, and recognizing that men and women oftentimes do bring different issues to whatever the table is. I wanted to ask a question about the comment you made about women <coughs> being self-deprecating, making themselves wrong, right. lots of guilt. There's a growing focus in the field of psychology on a concept called self-compassion. And we know that there are ways of enhancing the self-compassion of a person. And I'm wondering if any of the programs that you're aware of administrating use any of the tools, skills, and strategies of self-compassion to further empower women? Yeah, I don't know if, I mean, I can't say specifically, but I think it is a, you know, in a general sense, yeah, I mean, I think that's the core of a lot of, um, you know, empowerment programs is, you know, give yourself a break and appreciate who you are. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know that particular school of, of, you know, thought or discipline, but I think it is pretty core to, um, you know, looking at how do you, how do you feel good about yourself? So, you know. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, one question. Um, some of us who have made forays into doing some development work, you know, in the field in low-income countries sometimes get discouraged when um, confronted with, you know, corruption, mismanagement, misappropriation of funds, things like that. I'm just curious, what, what do you tell staff um, when something goes wrong in the field, when funds go missing or they're poorly managed or whatever, to keep people from just getting cynical and wanting to walk away and saying to heck with it, to sort of keep the optimism to sort of learn and move beyond it? Yeah, it's a big issue. Um, you know, it's an international organization that's, that is working in environments where, you know, oftentimes corruption or bribes or, you know, um, any kind of, you know, um, funding mis misappropriations is part of the fabric. And, you know, we have to be very um, absolute about, you know, a no corruption type of policy. And it does mean from time to time, you know, it, it is at odds with what happens within, you know, and I mean, we have uh, dealing with a situation now where, you know, we know that blatant, um, you know, fraud and misappropriations of huge amounts of funding because it's just kind of the way business is, is done. But I think you just have to take a no tolerance policy. And, you know, um, I, I think one of the real contributions that an organization like CARE makes is, I mean, we're very much a fabric of the societies in which we work. So if you were to go to any country office, you know, 99% of our staff are people from the countries in which we work. You might have one or two, you know, Americans or Europeans or whatever. And, you know, I think, I, I think that we're trying to, within our organization, live the same sort of principles that we're doing in our work. So accountability, uh, transparency, good governance, all those same sorts of things that we're doing within the context of our program are also the ways in which we're working um, you know, with our own staff and having really frank dialogues. I mean, you know, the, the issue of gender inequality, you know, we're coming, we're working in countries where gender inequality is the norm. So we've got to deal with that within our own staff. And we've had a program that really focuses on how do you have those tough decision, tough kind of discussions. Um, 
you know, we face the, the issue of um, religious inequality. You know, we're in some countries where Muslim Hindu or Muslim Christian um, uh, issues are as real within our own staff or minority uh, populations within, you know, our own staff communities play out the same things that are going on you know, within the broader society. So, you know, corruption is very much a part of that as well. And we just have to have a no tolerance policy and work on that. And yes, there are times when it can be incredibly demoralizing, uh, particularly if we don't act on it very quickly, because uh, there are times where it has become corrosive within the environment because people know that it's going on and are wondering why somebody doesn't act on it. But it just, you know, it is core to, to us living our values um, to, you know, work on, you know, kind of a zero tolerance policy around that. And as a, you know, because we're a non-governmental organization, we don't have to worry or don't, you know, government, government corruption is not an issue because I get asked a lot, you know, well, you know, you're working in those places and, you know, doesn't money go to the governments and siphoning it off or whatever, we're a non-governmental organization. <coughs> so we don't have the issue of government corruption, but um, you know we do have to deal with it within our own ranks. I'm wondering um, <coughs> if you could comment a little bit about the effect of the Arab Spring uh, on kind of your work around the world, as well as kind of the movement here in the U.S. Uh, that really is that the Occupy movement that's trying to take a tougher look at income inequality and has has that made a difference and then the last piece of that is really the technology that is what has the internet done to to your work okay so Arab Spring interesting um, you know um, I went to Egypt uh, about a month ago a little bit over a month ago it was almost a year to the day to the anniversary of when Mubarak left a um, lot of talk about you know, the change and the transformation, people talked about it very openly. Uh, a lot of disappointment that things had not moved as far as people would have wanted. Uh, but again, similar to what we were talking about with healthcare, I think there was a move forward that I don't think will ever be pushed back. And I think that people who felt the sense that they um, stood up to power and, and were able to make a change, we'll never lose that. And so while there is some retrenchment post Arab Springs in a lot of the countries um, and a rolling back of some of the gains that, that I think were realized during that, I think there's a generation of people who feel like we now know that, w that if we take a stand, we can make a difference. And so I think that, you know, I think it will continue to move forward and, you know, um, it's in, in each of the countries, it's playing out in very different ways, but I, don't, I just don't think that the Middle East will ever be the same again, um, post Arab Spring. Um, Occupy, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I caught something along the way. Occupy, I don't know, I mean, you know, um, when we were do, out doing protests, we always had a goal, we always had something we were working for. Um, I, I, I don't quite, Sleeping in tents, I, I, you know, I'm not against. I, I like it. I mean, I like, I like the notion. I just don't know. Um, I think it has risen the visibility of the issue. I just wish for the Occupy movement that there had been, or was a more tangible. You know, there is income uh, disparity. Therefore, we are pushing to do X. So. You know, they've moved the first step forward, which is to raise the issue that this is not a classless society. We do have income um, inequality. It is very real, and it's getting worse. And I think it's great that that, that, that visibility is raised. I just wish that there would then be the, okay, post tense. You know, what is it that we're working for? What legislation do we want to pass? Who do we want to get out of office? Who do we want to get in office? Who do we, you know, something. But you know, it, it, it does raise the issue of the 99.1% uh, per divide or whatever. Um, so you know, so be it. 
technology, I think, is changing the world. Um, you know, it, it's what caused the air, not caused the air spring, but it, what, it, it facilitated that kind of movement. Um, I was in um, Saudi Arabia, um, you know, uh, again on the trip when I went to Egypt, that was about six weeks ago, whatever, sitting in my um, fully covered garb, black, you know, headdress, whatever, sitting with a room of Arab um, men in their white robes, whatever. Um, and they were all saying, you know, we know that this is, that we are going to have to change as a society. We, there is no question. Um, the younger generation has far too much access to information to ever think that this world is the way it's going to be and meant to be. And, and we've got, and they know that they have to prepare for a world that is gonna be very different. You know, once you have access to information, all bets are off. I mean, you can't change, you know, you, once people realize that there is a broader world out there, you know, it just does th things to people. Um, bad and good. I mean, I, you know, I, I, um, not, uh, not bad in the sense that information is ever bad, but I just think, um, you know, sometimes it creates illusions that um, may not be helpful. But for the most part, I think once people understand that there's a broader world out there that, you know, that, um, um, you know, there are greater freedoms, there are greater ability to access uh, to fulfill potential in ways that didn't, they didn't realize exist before. I think you just create something that changes. And you know, you go across the world and there is not, you know, you, there is no place that I go where I can't get my Blackberry to work these days. You know, it is astounding the corners of the earth that I go and I'm able to send, and you all know it because I send you texts from all over the world. <laughs> Um, you know, from the most remote corners in the world, you know, I'm sending, um, you, you know, messages. So I, I, I just think it's astounding. And, you know, whether it's our work it, with the most rural farmers uh, in the corner of the earth who now are able to do sophisticated supply and demand curves because they can send an internet to the market you know, uh, in the capital city and decide what they're gonna price their yams for or what they're gonna sell their fish for. And, you know, this is a illiterate farmer or, you know, um, um, livestock owner in some rural co place in, in the most remote corner of the earth. And it, so it's just changing the world and changing what's possible. I think it's, uh, you know, it's tremendous. A woman who's giving birth in a hut can SMS a health worker, you know, in the next city and decide whether or not she needs to, you know, figure out how to get the local taxi to take her into the health center. You know, it's pretty astounding. So. Any other questions? Be um, curious just to hear about CARE's work with displaced <coughs> women and refugee communities, and um, we've talked a lot here about educating women as a strategy. And I'm just curious about that particular population where there's really no root or no home base anymore, and how CARE's. Yeah, well, you know, it varies a lot, and it varies a lot depending on whether you're talking about people who are kind of temporarily displaced or long-term displaced. You know, we've got camps that we operate in places like um, uh, Kenya, where there's been a refugee camp there now, um, for, particularly for Somali refugees for, for years and years, and that's become almost a stable um, you know, living environment. So, you know, it really depends on if it's kind of transient or long-term. But you know, even in those environments, uh, you know, or the, after the Haiti earthquake, which was you know <coughs> more temporary, and then how do you try to get people integrated? But in all of those um, you know kind of emergency and, and displaced person situations, women are uh, again at greatest risk. And you know, we one of the things that we focus on is making sure that 
women and girls are safe in those environments because they are often um, sexually abused, physically abused, um, the last ones to get food, shelter, uh, and you know, women who are pregnant are more likely to die you know, if they're in those emergency situations. So we place a lot of focus on making sure that in emergency situations or in situations where there are displaced persons that the needs of uh, women and girls are, you know, kind of high on the list because, you know, added to their already vulnerable situation, they become even that much more vulnerable in those circumstances. So I want to uh, thank Helene Gale for joining us tonight, and I hope you all will uh, give her a round of applause for really an excellent, excellent thank you. presentation. Thank you.